In this video, I'm going to demonstrate Grubb's outlier test. It's an outlier test that's actually very similar to the extreme z-score outlier test, which I've discussed in a previous video and that I don't uh, like because I think it identifies outliers far too frequently, so it's identifying outliers that are not outliers. Grubb's test is an advancement over the z-score extreme approach because it takes sample size into consideration. So as your sample size gets larger, the criterion value uh, gets larger as well, and that's a good thing. So here's the uh, paper I think that's probably the best one to consult for Grupp's outlier test because you have to consult tables to determine whether the value is sufficiently large. And the crux of the Grubb's outlier test is calculating z-scores, which Grubb and Beck refer to as t underscore n. It's basically a z-score but it's an absolute uh, z-score. So you need to take, uh, you need to disregard uh, negative and positive signs and treat only uh, absolute values. And then once you get the absolute z-score values, you consult the tables that, uh, that Grubbs and Beck created. And I'll show you how to use those uh, in a minute with an example. Uh, but I'll just note here that uh, you can see that sample size increases from one uh, of sample size of 3 up to 50, uh, and the table continues all the way up to 147. Uh, and you can use various levels of confidence, and people, I've noticed, tend to use the upper 2.5%, uh, which kind of sounds like you're using a 5% uh, alpha level, but because this is a one-sided test, I'm not sure that's, that's really quite how you should interpret that. Uh, because you're using absolute values, everything falls to one side. I think you, uh, for 95% confidence, you'd probably use the upper 5%, uh, but most people seem to be using the upper 2.5%, which is 97.5% confidence. And then you've got the upper uh, 1%, which is 99% confidence. I think using one of these two is probably the best way to go. Uh, the upper 5%, I think, is a little bit, a little bit uh, liberal. Uh, and most people seem to be using 2.5%. Uh, so how to do this test, I'll show you an example of it, and I'll show you why I think it's actually a good test, or at least better than the very commonly observed ex extreme z-score approach where they use a z-score of 3.0 or greater. So here I have some data about education, earnings, and IQ, and I'm going to focus uh, on the IQ data. And if I wanted to find out if there are any outliers in these uh, IQ data, based on Grubb's test, I'd need to first convert them into z-scores, and that can be done pretty easily by uh, sta save standardized values as variables. This is in SPSS. Other uh, programs would have similar uh, options. So here I've created the z-scores, and I could make the extra step of actually uh, calculating the absolute values, but if you're clever enough to keep in mind that positive and negative uh, means the same thing, uh, in, with respect to Grubb's test, you could then proceed to look at what the largest uh, value is, whether it's positive or negative. And that's what I'm going to do here, but if you want to yeah, if you want to follow the step of calculating absolute values, you can do that too by subtracting the negatives. Uh, and in SPSS you would just uh, create an absolute function like so, and you'd put the z-score in there. And look, I'm just going to do it anyway, as, as it turns out. Uh, so z i q absolute, and that creates absolute values with no negatives. And then I can actually look at the disc frequencies, or actually, uh, I'm going to look at the explore because it'll give it to me in a smaller table. Uh, so I'm going to put absolute in there, and I'm going to look at statistics, and you want to make sure this is outliers is really just going to give you the top five and bottom five outlying quote-unquote values, and I've got statistics clicked here because I don't want to see any of the plots. And here we can see that the largest absolute z-score values correspond to let's just say these two values here, 3.11, 3.41. Now using the extreme z-score approach, which is very common, you'd identify these two values as outliers. And that's true even though I can tell you that this 
person with a Z score of 3.41 has an IQ score of 160, which is technically possible on a Wechsler scale. I, th I believe it's the highest score possible on the Wechsler scale. And a Z score of 3.11 co corresponds to something lower than 160. Let's just say it's 145 or something like that. Are these outlying values? Uh, well, according to the extreme Z-score approach, you would think it, it is, but in the, based on the Grubbs test, uh, which is a better test, what we should do is we should find what the critical z absolute Z-value is to demarcate a significant outlying value. And let's just say we're going to use the upper 2.5%. And what I find here is that for a sample size of 140, which is what my sample size is in this data set here, oh, it's actually 120. 120, find the relevant sample size, which is right here, 120. And I can see that a Z score, absolute Z score of 3.44 or greater, based on Grubbs tables, should be considered a possible outlier. And in this case, I do not have outliers because 3.41 is lower than 3.444. So these data do not have any outliers based on Grubbs tests, which is a good thing uh, because I think these values are not actually outlying values to the extent that they would ruin your analysis with, which, with a parametric analysis. So the last thing I'm going to do is look at the frequency, uh, look at the histogram rather and let's just let's actually not look at the let's look at the real scores raw charts histogram and let's see what that looks like so this is what it looks like visually and a lot of people would be concerned by these values and they'd be thinking oh these might be outliers i should delete them uh and if you use the extreme z score approach you would these two anyway uh but with grubbs test you would not and that's a good thing i think uh, so whether this test is better than the interquartile range rule, which I've discussed in a previous uh, video, I don't know. I don't know if that simulation study has been done. It would be a useful one to be conducted. I suppose a negative with Grubbs test is that it only goes up to 147. The tables, I haven't, I did a quick search to see if anyone's expanded the tables. I haven't seen one, so that would be a useful study there. I suspect there's an algorithm to derive this, and um, it might be in one of Grubb's original papers uh, that I haven't looked at yet. Uh, so it would be useful to expand uh, these tables to ever larger sample sizes, uh, because I suspect people are deleting uh, values when they shouldn't be. So that's an example of the Grubbs test. So one last thing, Grubbs does show how to look for multiple outliers at the same time, and it's a little bit uh, more complicated to do so. So if you continue in his paper, you'll find a, a slightly more complicated procedure to identify two or more, I think actually only two outliers at the same time. So if you actually found this value to be an outlier, let's say that was 3.5, and then you had to evaluate whether this was an outlier, you would have to use the, um, the, sec the second pro approach that Grubbs discusses. So I hope you enjoyed that video. Checking out outliers with Grubbs test. I think it's a useful one, and I'll check it. I'll um, catch you next time.